All right, so I'm going to try to be uh, really direct and honest. Um, Thank you. So, um, short statement and then two, two related questions. Short statement, um, I, I'm immediately uh, angered and offended that this kind of thing happens on public property. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what, where I'm coming from. But yep. given that, I'm going to try to ask very honest, direct questions. You bet. Um, so on the Can first, I respond to your first statement? Yeah, of course. This conversation involves deep philosophical and theological issues concerning belief, evidence, and the nature of morality. Here's a summary and some insights based on the key points raised. I think what you've just expressed is the essence of intolerance. I respect anybody's right to stand out here, be they atheist, communist, Marxist, Leninist, capitalist, agnostic, Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, and say what they want to say. And I'm very grateful that I live in a country that supports free speech. Secondly, I thought that I was in a liberal arts educational environment. I thought that the basis of liberal arts education was the belief in the free exchange of ideas, the right to disagree with each other and then to explain respectfully why we disagree. The initial concern was about religious discussions on public property. The speaker defends the right to free speech, emphasizing the importance of exchanging ideas in a liberal arts educational environment. The speaker explains that many former atheists came to believe in God by examining the evidence for his existence and the historical reliability of Jesus Christ. The discussion involves the challenge of moving from theism to theism and the importance of being open to evidence and logic. The speaker emphasizes that belief in God and Jesus Christ should be based on evidence and reason. Faith is not a blind leap, but a step based on the evidence of Jesus' life, teachings, and resurrection. The importance of examining historical and philosophical evidence is highlighted. Well, I was hesitant to stand up anyway, but I would actually like to ask two questions, and they're coming from my heart, okay? Okay. Um, as someone who has been raised outside of the church, and I just don't take the Bible as evidence, is there any way that I could be converted? Is that the only way that you can reach out to someone that doesn't have any kind of cultural upbringing, that hasn't been raised with already those doubts? How can you speak to someone who's absolutely legitimately an atheist? Please, I mean, please answer directly. I have many friends who are former atheists. And these people who are former atheists relax their mind, they try to be as objective as possible, and to look at the evidence that God exists. And then once they move from atheism to theism, then they relax their mind, they try to be as objective as possible and read the Gospels, not as the Word of God, simply as accurate history, because the evidence is the Gospels give us some accurate history. And confronted by the lifestyle, teachings, death and resurrection of Christ, they saw the evidence is Christ is reliable and they chose to put their faith in Him. So you, you, you said that there were two steps there? The second step, once you've acknowledged that there could be some sort of right. all-knowing, all-powerful, all-good thing, right. um, the second, after, once you've done that, that's fine. It's that first step that I'm really concerned with. So you're saying that there's actually fact-based evidence that is best explained through an existence of God. Philosophical evidence, yes, sir. I'm not talking specifically about um, experiments or anything like that, but even, even philosophical evidence. Philosophical and you think, evidence. And you think that's the best, most rational explanation? Yes. Okay, so we, we have thousands of years of history of, dis of debates about these kind of things, and I don't want to revisit those, but do you have an answer for someone who's already gone through those and hasn't been convinced of the factual ac accuracy or of Occam's razor? I mean, if, there, if, if I honestly think that there are just more reliable descriptions that match the facts better, theory that just has fewer things that you have to assume that explain it just as well, if I'm in that position, Knowing that I am a limited person and could be wrong, is there room for faith? That was kind of a technical question. Would you like me to try to repeat it? Mm -hmm. The conversation discusses the source of human value and morality. The speaker argues that without God, human value and morality are subjective and relative and morality are subjective and relative, leading to potential ethical chaos. The concept of intrinsic value as given by God is contrasted with the idea of value being a human construct. The discussion acknowledges that doubt is a natural part of the human experience, even for those with strong faith. The example of John the Baptist, who doubted while in prison, is used to illustrate this point. The speaker encourages ongoing examination and openness to evidence, even for those who currently do not believe in God. Sir, all you've got to do is 
Look at the evidence for the reliability of Christ. Then you say, no, I'm sorry, not enough evidence, I can't believe. But when you say that, what you are clearly saying is, before I trust anything to be true, it must meet this level of evidence. So my two questions for you then are, in light of the fact that Jesus Christ is not supported by enough evidence, what is the object that you have chosen to trust in and secondly, what is the preponderance of evidence that supports this option as being more reliable than Christ? I would say that the, the discussion isn't between two different things that, that explain the, the, the environment that we see, but it's a very specific proposition of either an all-knowing, all-powerful God exists, or it doesn't. And I believe that the evidence supports the second. And I don't think that you need to, that that, that argument specifically requires there to be something else that you believe in. Just like I mean, you can talk about the non-existence of something. If it were, if it logically would impact your life in some way and it doesn't impact in your life in that way, then it doesn't exist without positing something else instead. Tonight, when you put your head on your pillow, tonight when I put my head on my pillow, like it or not, you are living for something or someone. Like it or not, I'm living for someone or something. You have said the reason that you cannot believe in Christ is because of a lack of evidence. No, I said an evidence against. That's a very important difference. All right, fine. Evidence against. Okay. So what I need to challenge you to do is explain to me what or who you are living for and why. What's all the evidence that points to whatever the option is you've chosen other than Christ? What's this overwhelming evidence that has convinced you that this option is more trustworthy than Christ? Well, we're talking about two different things here, um, and I, I'm going to, I'm trying to answer your question. This is the only way I know how. Um, I'm talking about whether something exists or not, and you brought in value. You brought in, why, why are you living? What are you living for? You, you know, what, why are you good? Something like that. Like, what is your purpose? And the question that I was asking was very much about what exists, and if God does not exist, frankly, if nothing above me exists, that doesn't imply that I have nothing to live for. Right. That, yeah, and I do definitely have things to live for that right. I can specifically point to that have nothing to do with whether there's a God. Right. That's right. I know that. Okay. Then I, just I don't thought understand I just... why there's a connection there. For some reason, you and the two gentlemen before, I'm not sure that you guys respect language the way I do. How do you mean? I agree with those who say that language can just be a power move to assert your power. And that happens at times. But I'm convinced that if we take language seriously and if we listen to each other, we can have meaningful conversation. I thought I just said to you, tonight, when you put your head on your pillow, like it or not, you're going to have to acknowledge you're living for something or someone. Like it or not, when I put my head on my pillow tonight, I'm going to have to acknowledge I'm living for someone or something. I agree with that. We both have faith. Now, you have said to me crystal clearly that there is not enough evidence that God exists, and you didn't want to hear me go over that evidence, and I respect that. And you have also clearly said that there's not enough evidence that Jesus Christ is reliable. Fine, no problem. But when you say to me, the reason you can't believe that God exists, the reason you can't believe that Jesus Christ is the truth is because of lack of evidence. In order not to be an intellectual hypocrite. Mm. The speaker challenges the idea that morality can be entirely subjective, using examples like terrorism and racism to illustrate the need for an objective moral standard. Uh, the conversation touches on different ethical frameworks including Kantian ethics, which suggests a shared human understanding of right and wrong without necessarily invoking God. The speaker argues that without God, life lacks ultimate purpose and meaning, leading to despair. This point is supported by references to existentialist thinkers like Camus, who grappled with the meaninglessness of life without a higher purpose. The belief in eternal life in heaven is presented as the ultimate affirmation of human worth and purpose. In summary, this conversation explores the complex interplay between faith, evidence, morality, and the human search for meaning.
It encourages a thoughtful examination of the evidence for God and Jesus Christ and underscores the importance of having a reasoned basis for belief or disbelief 